Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor at the Mises Institute. And joining me today are my co-host, Tho Bishop. And also we have our economist, our in-house economist, Jonathan Newman. And uh, Jonathan recently wrote an article called What the Media Says About Homeschooling. And we're just going to talk about that a little bit, but also just some broader uh, issues related to homeschooling, mostly homeschooling policy. Um, it's, uh, it's up to you whether you want to homeschool people. But uh, we will talk about some of the, the policies related to it and the issue of freedom in schooling in general. Uh, but first, Jonathan, uh, I just wanted to mention that you have a new project coming out, and uh, this is Lessons for the Young Economist. Uh, tell us just a little bit about this real quick. Yeah, the Lessons for the Young Economist is a great textbook that was uh, written by Robert P. Burphy, uh, one of our uh, outstanding scholars here at the Institute. Um, and he wrote it uh, a few years ago, and it's great It's great for the high school level. I've even used it in an undergraduate freshman principals course. Uh, it's, it's a great textbook that goes through all the principles of economics. And uh, I, I wanted to, it, it, it's a great textbook. It's already being used by homeschool families, but, and it has this teacher's guide, but I wanted to add some extra materials to go along with it to make it even more attractive, especially for homeschool families, but really anybody who wants to uh, learn more about economics could could benefit from this. And so the project that we're working on is is recording some lecture videos, some some supplemental videos to go along with each chapter of that textbook, uh, just to sum things up, make sure people are getting the high points, and you know change the the format of delivery that should be coming out early next year. And that's a very exciting project. I actually have some uh, couples that I've met at my local church that used that, that book. So very excited for more content there. And also just want to let our audience know that next week is our uh, fall campaign at the Mises Institute. So you'll be seeing a lot of pop-ups. You'll be seeing a lot of promotions for that. We will have some special deals here with Radio Rothbard. Obviously, we are not uh, funded by any large international oligarchs. You get no state grants, obviously. We are only supported by people like you who understand how important these ideas are. So if you are uh, not a Mises donor, um, next week is a very nice week to give even just a small donation. Every single penny helps going to support projects like Lessons for the Young Economist and everything that we do here at the Mises Institute. And it should be noted that unlike national public radio that has its own funding drives, we receive zero dollars in government money. In zero. case there's any question about that, the Mises Institute is in no way government funded, uh, and it has always been that way. Including All right. international well, governments. No, no, no Russia funding. <laughs> right. No governments. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about homeschooling a little bit. Homeschooling policy, really, and. Uh, are just the satisfaction level that people have with public schooling, which I think uh, the the number of people who homeschool is, is rather a reflection in many cases. Not all. Um, some people, of course, would think, well, homeschooling is the ideal form of homeschooling, and even if I liked the public schools, that would not be sufficient for me. Some people they homeschool because as in uh, because it's a better alternative to public schooling uh, in some cases they homeschool because private schools are very expensive or there aren't any nearby that are satisfactory there's all sorts of things going on there uh, but I think what we have noticed as you note in your your article uh, from late last month, Jonathan, is that the media doesn't seem to love homeschooling. Uh, they seem to have uh, many problems with it. And uh, this, of course, is not surprising at all. Uh, but just to get us going, why don't you, you note uh, <laughs> why, why they're even saying this and how apparently the numbers of people who have chosen to homeschool have been increasing in recent years. Yeah, in my article, I, I started off just by pointing out that it seems like the media is struggling to decide whether to ignore the homeschooling trend or to just try to totally destroy it, argue against it. Um, and I think the reason why they are facing that choice to argue against it is because they do realize that it is becoming very, very popular. Uh, so I show some data from the National Home Education Research Institute. And based on their data, in the 1970s, there's like a few thousand families that were homeschooling. So it was tiny, tiny minority. 
but now uh, the most recent data on this chart from 22 is uh, 3.1, over 3.1 million uh, students uh, are being homeschooled. And of course, some of that is is um, based on a surge in homeschooling after the whole COVID regime. Um, but if you look at the data, if you just look at the trajectory, even if you looked at the pre-COVID years, like 2016 to 2019, uh, we're still above trend. So there was a big explosion up to 3.7 million in, uh, in 2021. Uh, right after COVID hit, and it's come down some after that, but even so, we're still above that pre-COVID trend. So there's just, so basically, what I'm saying is there's been a huge explosion in homeschooling, and so you would think that something that has become so popular would be all over the news. But something that is like this big growing trend in education in the United States would be all over the news, but it's not really. There, I mean, there's a few articles here and there, and the articles that you can find, especially in uh, mainstream media, uh, are dismissive of it, uh, or at least uh, they they might say that, you know, there's some good reasons to choose to homeschool, but you really need to factor in all of these cons, all of these, you know, negative aspects. And some of the things that they point, it's a lot of fear mongering. It's like, oh, the state, the state isn't regulating it. The state isn't, doesn't have any oversight over what's happening inside the home. So they can't keep track of academic standards. Uh, like what if there's a, abuse in the home and what, what there's all of these sort of what ifs, all of these things that there's like not a, there maybe not any uh, cases of, of abuse happening because a family has chosen to homeschool. Um, and yet they're sort of like scaremongering, fear mongering over this sort of thing. But then there's also, like I said, a lot of uh, state paternalism where they're saying, you know, homeschooling is a threat because not everybody, not every student in the United States is going to get the state approved narrative over COVID, over economics, over history, over anything. So everybody, all of these students that are in, in homeschool families, they're going to get basically their parents' views on things. That's their claim, as opposed to the totally unbiased views presented by homeschool, I mean, uh, public school teachers. So that's, that's, that's what you get from the media these days. Well, I think a lot of that interest in homeschooling that we saw occur during uh, COVID was a result somewhat in many cases of people seeing what their children were actually being taught at these schools. Now, a lot of this is on the parents, right? If you were too lazy to figure out what your children are being taught at school before COVID and it required the classroom being brought into your home for you to care or see, that's that's pretty sad that, that <laughs> you should win a bad parenting award. Uh, because during COVID was the first time you really saw or had some sense firsthand of what your, your children are being taught in these schools. Uh, there's really no excuse for that, but uh, it's, it's good that that was finally forced in a lot of people's faces because what was happening was people had, you know, like many Americans, they just sort of like dropped their kids off at school um, at the free daycare center, which is essentially what it is to a lot of parents. And uh, then they forgot about it until the, they, they saw the kids later that day. And they didn't ask too many questions. But what happened during COVID is then it was online schooling. And they started to see firsthand what was being told to their children by these quote unquote educators. And they, they realized what a complete waste of time it was and how it was just so much talk about conditioning your child to think certain types of political thoughts or just the thinness of the educational material and how much time was just being spent on discussing uh, the teacher's feelings about things. I think we all remember this a bit about teachers. They loved talking about themselves. And now we, we see it in a, in a number of cases that teachers love talking about their sexual habits and things like this to kids. And uh, I think, uh, well, that probably wasn't happening commonly on these online uh, teaching uh, teaching events that were occurring. I, I don't even know if you call them. They're not real like classroom teaching uh, in any real meaningful sense, but there was some instruction going on over the internet during COVID and the parents saw this and they thought, wow, this is what's going on in public school, huh? And so in some cases that translated into these parents homeschooling, though obviously the ones who actually cared more uh, about what was actually going on. 
And I think that that really helped push up these numbers. But as you note, it didn't go back to the former trend uh, after that occurred. And I think that probably indicates that there probably is a continuation of this trend going on that will continue upward in terms of numbers. And I think a lot of that is just due to a lot of the different resources that are now available for homeschoolers that weren't available, say, 10 years ago, just in terms of uh, curriculum and in terms of uh, working with other students in a group and just really being able to do something that uh, really extends the instruction beyond, uh, quote unquote, home. That is, the, the stereotype, of course, is that children, they all just stay at home all day and they don't do anything and they don't interact with anybody. And there certainly have been times and places where that may have been the case, where there weren't other homeschool children available and there weren't programs available for those children. But that's certainly not the case now, and it's much less so the case now even compared to 10 years ago. Uh, and you have to go well, you have to go about 20 years ago or more to find those situations where you didn't have local organizations offering programs for homeschoolers and that sort of thing. And of course, it's better in bigger cities than in smaller ones in terms of these programs, but there's just a lot more available. And so I think it's easier to homeschool now uh, for a lot of people than was the case in the past. But I do think that a lot of it continues to be a function of uh, people realizing that the education being offered by public schools just really isn't that impressive. And maybe it would be best if their child spent all their days learning something other than um, the importance of LGBT acceptance and things like that. Maybe they should be learning some math or some science or reading or <laughs> writing or that sort of thing instead, because it's clear that that's not what the emphasis is in these public schools. Yeah, you, you made a point in there about uh, about what homeschool uh, families are doing um, and about socialization, and you know they're not just you know staying inside of their houses. Uh, there's some brand new data. I think this came out just in the past few days from the uh, U.S. Department of Education. So they had this big survey that they do about uh, um, how students are being educated, and uh, they actually a, a part of the survey asked uh, about non-school activities that students are involved in, and it's broken down by public school, private school, homeschool. And homeschool, it's not surprising, but homeschool families were more likely to go to the zoo, go to the aquarium, go to a museum, historical site, library, bookstore. So like they're, in terms of like community involvement, getting out, also uh, they actually mentioned um, like community events, religious events, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of things that are out and about in the community. Um, the, the homeschool families are, are more likely to, to be involved in those sorts of things and go visit those places. Uh, because homeschool parents realize that uh, there's a benefit to, you know, going and seeing things hands-on. It's like there's one thing to read about a dolphin and another thing to actually see one swimming around in an aquarium or a zoo. Right. Well, <laughs> it is really just quite amazing how much time is spent in school, in these institutions, doing very, very little in terms of actual academic instruction. Any of us who went to public school remember how that worked. Uh, so much time going from class to class, and then time settling the class down, and then doing a bunch of administrative tasks, and then people talking about their feelings and all that sort of thing, um, which uh, just has very little to do with education. And what's interesting is how much time children spend in school now compared to in the past. Uh, I looked up I've often actually wondered about this, and I looked up on Our World in Data, which is a very helpful uh, research site, and, and because it basically I love just that compiles. Website. Yeah, I mean, isn't it fun? It has all these great graphs and such, and it's not like they just made up this data. It's, it's all based on some, some academic research from the past or some government data. They give you the data source. This, and on the matter of how much do children spend in school, how much time, there's a great little graph here based on Ramey and Francis, 2009. This is an academic article from 2009. And it looks at how much time are children spending in school on a weekly, hourly basis. And the reason I thought of this was because I remember talking to my father, who was born in 1941, and talking about school with him. And when he was a child, their school was half day. Uh, as as a effort to economize on the school building and the school resources, they had two, they ran two schools out of one school building in the sense of 
there was a one group of students that came in and they went to school from about eight to lunch. And then there was a, and then they all went home. And this was like third, fourth grade. This wasn't pre-K or anything. And then they all went home and then a second group of kids came in in the afternoon and they went to school from like 1230 to 430, something like that. And so they were able, of course, then to get twice as many students out of uh, one classroom. And that, of course, meant that you're spending a lot less time in school back in the 40s and the early 50s. And this, this checks out, of course, if you look back at what data has been compiled. If you look at the amount of school time, average weekly hours devoted to school by age group in the United States, it shows that you've got ages 14 to 17 was 16 hours. So these are high school students. 16 hours back in 1940. And now, as of 2005, and there's, it certainly hasn't gone down since then, uh, it's 24 hours. Because it's long been the view of school administrators that school instruction gets better if you force children to sit in classrooms longer. <laughs> And uh, I, you know, I don't, I'll, I'll leave it up to uh, educational experts to uh, make that case for me. But just as a layman, when it comes to uh, uh, <laughs> understanding how uh, public schooling and how education of children works, I don't think there's a clear correlation between the, the amount of education in a meaningful sense that a person receives uh, and the amount of time they sit in a classroom, and I think we—I think you would have a hard time convincing me that the average person who went to school for 18 hours in 1950 is was more poorly educated than the high school student who went to school in 2005, or it was 23 hours back in 1990. That that the people educated in 1990, 2000, 2005, or even 1980. Uh, are better educated now than those people. Uh, because we all know what's really going on with all those extra hours. It's a bunch of uh, social studies type stuff, indoctrination, or it's a bunch of extracurricular activities, which by the way are very expensive uh, in many cases. Uh, it's true that when my father went to school in 1950 for a half day, they didn't spend boatloads of time uh, doing uh, extra extracurricular activities. What they did was they spent more time with their families. And that, of course, is anathema to public school uh, administrators. They want you spending as little time as possible with your family. They want you institutionalized the maximum amount of time that they can get you. And if, if they can't justify enough school time, then they'll come up with after-school programs or school morning programs. And then, of course, uh, they want, on top of that, other ways of being able to observe the children and institutionalize them and just extend the number of years that everyone spends in school. And if you believe that those extra hours spent in school between, uh, between 50 years ago versus uh, last year is they're receiving practical, technical training that will prepare them for life. Uh, you, you'll often hear people with a straight face argue that, well, of course you have to spend more time in school now, we live in a technological society where people require more <laughs> schooling. Back in the 50s, of course, um, you know, they basically, they, they taught you how to, I don't know, maybe read a little bit, do a little bit of arithmetic, and that was it. Whereas in our technological society, people are learning advanced skills of technology. If you believe that children today in public high school are learning advanced technological skills that prepare them for life, you are not paying attention. That is not what's going on in public school. And, and, and the idea, of course, also that this requires many years more of education, 10 hours more of education in an institutional setting per day or per week. Uh, that's, that's not what's, what's going on. The <laughs> and then, of course, you would have to convince me that you need a lot of new technical education for all of these like marketing people who work at Facebook and such that that these people who work at who worked at pre Musk Twitter, who spent all of their days censoring, who spent all of their time uh, doing headhunting and marketing, uh, writing up copy for little little ads and such that that required a bunch of technical education in public school. Mm, I don't think it did.
Especially when we look at the videos these people were posting on their day of working at Facebook, right? They were drinking smoothies all day and hanging out in the yoga lounge. That, that apparently requires lots of serious schooling to prepare these people for that lifestyle. Uh, but people argue this. Um, the people who, of course, benefit personally from ever larger amounts of money being spent on public schooling and more and more time forcing children into these institutions, of course, they think that works. It's good for them. But uh, I, I really don't see any correlation whatsoever between uh, the two things. And, of course, parents should be free to choose for themselves whether their child should sit in one of these public schools for hours and hours learning whatever public, uh, whatever political agenda it is that their teacher uh, wants for them uh, instead of spending time in some other setting where they might be learning different skills and, uh, God forbid, a different political theory. What you're touching on there is uh, something that's widely known in the in the field of psychology and in the psychology literature. Uh, they talk about what's called the total time hypothesis, which is the idea that if you just dedicate more time to to learning something, you know, sitting down and just looking at something, are you uh, more likely to to recall it later? And what the, the conclusions uh, from the literature is that that really only works for certain types of content, certain types of of uh, tasks. So like if, if you're just trying to memorize by rote something, like a, all of the state capitals, something like that, then yeah, dedicating more time to memorizing those things by rote does help you recall. But the thing is that that is only one type of knowledge, one type of content, and it's only held in memory uh, short term. So like if you don't keep doing it, if you don't keep you know, going over all the state capitals in your head or rehearsing them, then you lose it over time. And the, the way to store things into long-term memory is through deep processing. Like you have, to, you have to think critically about something that you're learning, something that you're exposed to, for it to actually enter into your long-term memory. So the, the total time hypothesis uh, has been discredited or, you know, it's, it's okay in, it, for certain types of tasks like the rote memorization. But the, the cognitive psychology literature is clear that for long-term memory, for, for learning, basically, you, you need deep processing. Like, there's not a shortcut. You have to, you have to think about things. You have to uh, question things and ask whether uh, this is true or is it, or is it false or, and, and think about things in a, in a critical sort of way as opposed to just somebody blabbing in front of you or uh, you know, showing you all this information and you sit, you know, sit and stare at it for a long period of time. That's, at best, that's going to be short-term memory. But you know, knowing my kids, it, that's not going to result in uh, you know, any, anything close to you know, substantial learning. What does result in substantial learning for the long term is critical thinking and where are students most likely to get that sort of critical thinking? Is it is it when they're being presented with this state approved narrative about history, state approved narratives about everything, you know, biology? Uh, I mean, the politics has infected every single subject that's taught in in uh, public schools. Uh, or are they more likely to get that sort of critical thinking uh, from their parents who who might have different views. And so students are exposed to their parents' views, things that they see out in the world as well. Uh, you know, when they go visit a museum, they're seeing a different sort of view, perhaps. And so there's more exposure to these differences in views, uh, which I, I think promotes more critical thinking and better learning. So so you're absolutely right. The, the, the idea that just more time in the classroom results in better learning is is false. I think the, the most unintentional asset that I got from my public education is the stuff that I remember the best were the topics that I ended up arguing with my teacher about because they were wrong and I was right. And of course, that, that does always trickle up into to grade performance, right? That sometimes, uh, I, I don't want to suggest that public school teachers can be petty and vindictive, but you know, they definitely <laughs> you know, have some, some anecdotal evidence that might suggest that, that hypothesis. Uh, but go going back to, to your article and kind of the way the media has been presenting homeschooling is that you know, this sort of pushback is not coming from nothing either. Um, you know, one of the things I think is interesting is that this larger blowback to these traditional educational Kind of, kind of you know, traditional public school system. We've seen a lot of change 
obviously from a state by state approach in terms of kind of expanded voucher programs, charter schools, right? There's been a lot of innovation in terms of you know increased uh, virtual schooling as as a as a product out there. Sometimes the state provides and things like that. Is that there's been a lot, I think a lot of of reconsideration of it, and precisely because how important that public educational apparatus is to the state, there has been a leading drum, not simply from the media, but trickling down on desires to have increased state legislation, calls for red, uh, federal regulation to, to regulate homeschooling. Um, and, I, and one of the big fountainheads of this comes from Harvard, which has done a number of events in recent years dedicated towards addressing the uh, what they call a, a parental rights absolutism as an attack on the child's right to learning. Um, there's a professor, uh, <laughs> a Bartlett, who has called for, uh, has, has, has been advocating for um, both states and the feds to uh, proactively regulate homeschooling. And of course, regulation at this point um, in this consideration is to limit uh, the abilities for parents to homeschool, right? Trying to increase, say, standardized testing requirements and things like this. And it's also worth pointing out that the entire idea of completely abolishing, of criminalizing homeschooling is certainly not um, a unique, crazy idea. Uh, Germany, I believe, has strict bans on homeschooling through regulation, right? Yeah, they, they regulate it by banning it and things like that. Um, I've seen polling that shows that um, uh, 65 plus of a particularly kind of you know, Democrat voters want increased regulation of homeschooling alike. So there is an, an additional element to it where there's not simply sort of uh, people out there reevaluating, okay, well, why is there an increased demand for homeschooling? Um, but there's a recognition that this is a threat to certain agendas, and therefore there is a, a kind of growing drumbeat to utilize the power of the state, calls to utilize the power of the state to try to crack down on this crack in, in one of the most powerful tools that any regime has in terms of indoctrinating the next generation. That same expert that you just uh, uh, mentioned uh, was quoted in, in my article from one of the pieces that I was, that I was looking at. Uh, this is from a, an article in The Week, um, and it, it says, it also means that children are in danger of not learning basic academic skills or learning about the most basic democratic values of our society, or getting the kind of exposure to alternative views that enables them to exercise meaningful choice about their future lives. So um, it's, it's, it's clear that the, the distrust of homeschooling, it's, it's all based on we need every single citizen to go through the same system and learn the same narrative like we, we i mean they call it democratic values like we need to be the ones that instill democratic values in every citizen um and it's it's uh it's it's clearly indoctrination it's it's clearly this we we want the state to be in control of education and educating every single student because it's dangerous for people to have opposing views um and so some of this is projection it's like they're, they're saying it's uh children are in danger of not getting the kind of exposure to alternative views it's like <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about? It's like, the children are much more likely to be exposed to alternative views if they're outside of the public school classroom as opposed to inside the, the classroom. So there's lots of projection, lots of fear mongering, and of course, lots of paternalism here. At the end of the article, I provided a, a lengthy quote from, from Rothbard about um, uh, how, or why the state would want to take control of education. Um, and it's, it's all about, um, it's all about forming the whole person. So like, we don't just want to put the right uh, um, knowledge inside of people's brains uh, from the state's perspective. Like they want to form the whole person. They want to mold their values, mold everything about the, uh, the person. Uh, I'll quote just a little bit, to try to mold the whole child in the desired paths. Thus, modern education has abandoned the school functions of formal instruction in favor of molding the total personality both to enforce equality of learning at the level of the least educable and to usurp the general education role of home and other influences as much as possible. Since no one will accept outright state communization of children, even in communist Russia, it is obvious that state control has to be achieved more silently and subtly. And so there he's referring to compulsory education. 
He ends the quote by saying, for anyone who's interested in the dignity of human life, in the progress and development of the individual and free society, the choice between parental and state control over the children is clear. Well, and we should note also that, of course, this attempt to control schooling, control children, control instruction, it's, it's not just for homeschoolers, uh, that throughout its history, especially prior to uh, the 1930s, that the United States, that activists in the United States uh, made a number of concerted efforts to just completely shut down private schools overall. Homeschooling was to be outlawed. Private schooling was to be outlawed. And this occurred, uh, with, there's a monumental um, uh, Supreme Court case on this uh, that was decided back in the 1920s where there were attempts by the state of Oregon and then also other states to simply outlaw public schools uh, in general. And part of this was just based on uh, the idea of what we hear exactly today. The idea was, is that when children go, especially to Catholic school, they're not being uh, inculcated with dominant American values. This is what people were arguing in the 1920s. And so we need to get rid of those schools, especially these private religious schools, because people are learning a different view of the world and they're not becoming real Americans. And so in Oregon, they, they passed a statewide uh, referendum that, that said, yeah, you, no, more, no more private schools, you're all gonna be shut down by force. And uh, the, the Supreme Court ended up uh, returning a ruling on this. What was interesting is that they decided the ruling based on uh, private property. Today, if you had a case like that, they would probably decide it on something like religious freedom or something like that. But the Supreme Court back in the 1920s during the, uh, the so-called Lochner era, if you have studied legal history, you know that the Lochner era was unique, I suppose, for being a period when the right of contract was uh, vigorously defended by the court. And so the court rejected a lot of attempts to regulate economic activity based on the idea of, well, if you freely entered into a contract, then there's nothing the state can do to regulate it. So the idea that they decided in the case was called Pierce versus Society of Sisters, it wasn't so much religious freedom as just the idea that, hey, schools are private property. People uh, can enter into a contract to have their child educated in these schools, and it's not our place uh, to regulate that. As a side note, it's worth noting that uh, protection of private property is a protection of all your other rights, too, as was, as was the case here. Uh, but this wasn't just an Oregon thing. There's, there's a good book on this by Robert Gross called Public Versus Private, The Early History of School Choice in America. And he notes that in the 1920s, conservative Protestants staged the most concerted campaigns since the origins of public school systems to prohibit, to prohibit private education. In more than a dozen states, they tried but failed to prohibit attendance at private schools. While in Oregon, they successfully enacted a law compelling students to attend public school exclusively. These campaigns emerged from a post-World War I context rife with nativist anti-Catholic sentiment. Uh, he goes on to note, that uh, this was also the Catholics united with Lutherans in many cases because they were also targeted by <laughs> what Gross calls conservative Protestants, who also, by the way, hated German language schools. Uh, and you can see how that fits into this World War I context because there used to be a lot of German language schools in this country, which are private, which provided excellent instruction. Uh, but uh, the, the, the psychotic, hysterical, anti-German uh, movement in America had to uh, get rid of that. So a lot of those schools went in decline or were forced to shut down or to completely change their curriculum. But why does he refer to them as conservative Protestants? Well, what he means is ruling class uh, Protestants. These weren't Lutherans who often were uh, fresh German immigrants or maybe first or second generation because uh, a lot of Germans came in mid-century in the 19th century, and there was a lot of emphasis as well on their Germanness in those cases. That, that made them bad Americans. And of course, the Catholic schools were filled with Irish and Italians as well, and they were bad Americans. What the conservative Protestants, quote unquote, had was they had control of the culture in the public schools. They, and this is largely, they were the people who created the public schools, and their idea was, 
we'll have these public schools that'll teach kind of this watered down Protestantism. We'll read um, the King James Bible in school. Uh, we'll teach sort of this uh, this version of Christianity where where America is is history's greatest country and um, this and your your level of Americanness and how much you submit to the American government and, and the state governments is an indicator of how virtuous you are. And uh, I think in his own work, Rothbard, um, he refers to a lot of these people uh, in, in during the progressive movement, that these were, these were people from kind of the old WASP class. And they created the public schools to push this certain type of religion, this certain type of uh, form of patriotism. And this is also a very valuable lesson in thinking conservatives that you can, that you can use big government uh, to win against the libs. This is exactly what that was. This was a bunch of conservatives pushing their ideas of uh, conservative nationalism, uh, loyalty to the American state, uh, a certain type of uh, fondness for the founding fathers and, and this ideology that they associated with American nationalism and, and Americanism, uh, variously refined or uh, variously defined. And what, what happened, of course, was this institution that they founded to push their certain types of values fell into the hands of other people who now mm -hmm. push it, who now push entirely different types of values. So you have American conservatives to thank for the creation of the American public schools, and they were apparently too short-sighted to see that that institution might be taken over by others. And now this is the, the institution used to push leftist values more than any other institution uh, but it all started as a way to teach immigrants how to be a better Americans and to teach Catholics how to uh, uh, how to adopt their version of Christianity. And it all failed miserably uh, to preserve those values. And in the process, they said exactly what the left says now. These people aren't learning good American values, so we need to destroy freedom and shut down their ability to attend any schools that are not our approved version of government school. So you can see that impulse. Whoever's in the ruling class has this impulse. They want to destroy private education. They want to destroy school choice. And it changes over time who is in charge of it and what values they want to teach. But uh, public schooling, government schooling is an extremely important institution in that. And so we shouldn't assume that uh, they're going to hold back from trying to outlaw public schooling or, or that they're going to try and outlaw private schooling or homeschooling altogether. Uh, certainly in Europe, there is far, far less freedom, as, as Tho mentioned, in terms of, of homeschooling. And the reason you can send kids to public or to private schools uh, these more institutional settings is because they are more regulated, uh, that they have to report more to the government, and the, the government's like that. There, there's not real freedom in private schooling even because uh, there is a regulatory state that, uh, that indirectly oversees that. And then, of course, one thing that the government likes to do is also make private schooling very expensive, and because then that, uh, that keeps people out of it. If, if private schooling was a very affordable option, you'd have far more people availing themselves of it. Uh, but as long as you can keep regulating businesses, just as businesses, to keep the cost of any sort of institution very high, and you can also regulate them as schools, uh, then that helps as well. So th there is no interest, there's no good faith uh, that I can find in the public schooling establishment toward private instruction uh, in any way. They don't even like charter schools. They can't stand that even there's an aspect of public schooling that's not directly controlled by the teachers union and by administrators who want a one size fits all solution for everybody. So if they could outlaw homeschooling, they would do it in a second. If they could outlaw private schooling, they would do it in a second. Um, there is fortunately some legal barriers to doing that, but but I don't think we should forget at any time that what the real agenda is is to make everyone learn exactly the same thing, and that that curriculum be controlled by government bureaucrats and government administrators who have themselves gone through government-approved uh, educational um, programs, and it goes it goes way back. They're teaching what reflects the values they learned from the regime, and they certainly don't want to stop doing that. 
You remind me of one of my favorite bills. Uh, this one was uh, written and proposed by uh, Thomas Massey. Uh, the, the version I have here is the one that he uh, submitted last year. But the, the title of the bill is uh, to terminate the Department of Education. And uh, I'm going to read an entire bill for all the listeners of Radio Rothbard. I'm going to read an entire bill that was uh, proposed to the House. Here's the full text. This bill der- uh, terminates the Department of Education on December 31st, 2023. <laughs> so that's the full text of the entire bill, and I love it. I love that approach. It's just very simply, you know, explaining. There's, we don't need a bunch of research. Just this bill is going to terminate the Department of Education. Um, if only that had been voted on and approved. Well, and, and it is worth bringing up the larger sort of political environment where some of these conversations are happening right now because there has been this broader... Uh, action at uh, in various states to uh, increase funding options for uh, homeschooling parents, for charter schools, for private school scholarships and the like. Some of the language at the state level is very aggressive in terms of trying to prevent some of that uh, uh, regulation from creeping in, others less so. But one, one of the things I think is dangerous is that this larger fever Right, you know, the, the conservative quote unquote mainstream position now as a sort of blanket endorsement of school choice has percolated up to conversations about federal legislation, about extending um, you know, tax benefits and the like to try to basically nationalize some of these state by state school policies. And in doing so, um, you know, we, can have, you, we can have a separate conversation about kind of state level stuff, but if you open up that door to the feds, having that something that might seem like a good idea if you're in a a state like Arizona or Florida, something that might be working at some of those states. Um, If you open up those tools to the feds, then all of a sudden that creates a whole new door for the, you know, for all the, all the bad people, you know, know, for the, for the worst actor of government to start leveraging this new ability to do exactly what is feared there. And so I think that's another kind of larger conversation to have about uh, policies generally is that you know, again, stuff that might might work anecdotally at the state level, trying to, to scale that upwards creates all new problems. Because again, the incentive structure of DC is very different than the incentive structure of a state capital in many, many ways. And so that, that I think that's one aspect to it where again, political celebrations in terms of quote unquote economic freedom are not going to work in DC again like that 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 structure is again just just ready to create a new weapon to go against and to reverse any gains that people might perceive in terms of this new more skeptical landscape there and so that's again you, Ryan talked about earlier about can kind of conservatives creating this infrastructure that are now there uh, particularly Yankee conservatives um, you know, having opening up that door at the, that's at that national level is something I, I think should be, be done, you know, should should be very much opposed to anyone who who might see any gains at the state level as something worth celebrating. So, can you clarify though? Are you talking about uh, basically uh, like strings being attached to money? So, are you talking about funding going or, or subsidies or tax breaks for homeschooling or private schooling, and how the the federal government would have st- strings attached to that, and they'd be able to you know sneak in and start to regulate the curriculum? Is is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Again, there, there, there's a, a growing drumbeat about trying to nationalize the sort of school choice environment that has expanded at the state level. And again, as soon as you start you know, providing tax benefits, as soon, you know, whatever mechanism that looks like at the federal government, as soon as they start coming in and start creating those pockets and their ability to manipulate those, those, these, these new tools that they're providing, I think increases significantly. And so again, I, I think that you know, having, having those battles at that state level where you can have some experimentation in, in terms of you know, what, how, how do you best restrain some of these um, and some of the concerns that are obviously going to exist whenever you start allowing, again, I work Florida, for example, right? Um, homeschooling families can get scholarships to utilize at, you know, if you have a homeschooling child, you can um, actually get a scholarship to put your kid into some of those extracurricular activities that Ryan mentioned earlier that are expensive, right? So if you want to put your kid in gymnastics, you can actually get a scholarship to do that, get a school credit for doing that. And, and, and there are 
explicit restrictions in terms of state standardized testing and the like that exist mm. within that state. But you start, you, you put that upwards, the idea that the feds are going to have any sort of interest in maintaining that restriction in terms of, you know, where is that money going? Again, it, it opens up a whole new door in terms of these currently private institutions now having to jump through new hoops. You create a, a kind of an additional dependency now, right? You, you, you have parents that have gotten used to be able to using these state scholarships. If you open the door to the federal government providing it, um, you, you, you don't have the ability to say no to that, right? Because you, you've become dependent, you know, you, you need that, uh, you know, those, those benefits to afford this quality of education. And as soon as you open the door to the federal government playing a role in this, um, I, I think that, that you, you're opening the door to the Leviathan of trying to capture these currently private or private-ish um, institutions and put them more firmly under the, um, the wheel of the regime. All right. Well, on that, uh, <laughs> uh, th we have a tradition here at Radio Rothbard of always ending our episodes on the most ominous note we can come up with during the episode. Uh, so I think that fits. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and wrap up with that for this I episode. I can end on a happier note if you'd like. <laughs> so in, in my family, we're uh, homeschooling and we love it. It's going great. We get to pick what the students learn, what our kids learn. Uh, they, they get to do all sorts of fun activities. It's wonderful. Well, it should be noted there, that uh, at our, our recent event in Albuquerque, uh, they wanted to end on an up note. And so they, they asked me, it was me and Peter Klein speaking, and they said, so Ryan, what have you got? What do you got that's, that's optimistic? Of course, my mind's racing. I'm like, I don't, I don't. <laughs> it's the wrong uh, person. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I did come up with the homeschool issue. I was saying that the growth in, in institutions that do cater to homeschoolers, uh, mm -hmm. the increase in the amount of homeschooling and the fact that there is a lot of resources, there are many resources and there are many new institutions that do cater to make homeschooling easier, to create networks of homeschoolers, which of course it increases their power as a political force, uh, increases their ability to work together and then form future institutions as well is all far more advanced than it was 20 years ago. And uh, I think in some states, certainly not at all, in some states, I think you have reached that, that critical point where it would be very, very difficult to outlaw homeschooling because contrary to the stereotype, there are many people now who homeschool and they're not, they don't subscribe to any particular religious view or anything like that, even though many people who hate homeschooling seem to be under that uh, impression. That's just not the reality. So you get this broader coalition of people who are involved in homeschooling and in building these institutions. It's pretty hard to get rid of that. Not that it can't be done, but it makes it significantly more difficult. So I think that's definitely good news there. Uh, okay, so there. You, you, are you happy now, Jonathan? We ended <laughs> yeah. on, I'm, a, I'm, on a more optimistic happy. note. <laughs> when, of course, if any parents out there are looking for good materials, you know, to, to, to help feed, to help them this journey. I'm very excited for the Lessons of the Young, for, for the Young Economist video series coming out. We've got a lot of great animated videos at Mises.org slash begin as well. That kind of tailored with a high school, high schooler in mind. And of course, we've got plenty of information at Mises.org in a variety of, uh, variety of capacities. Uh, less, uh, economics for uh, in one lesson, uh, how to think about the economy. So again, plenty of resources out there. And again, a good economic education is one of the best bulwarks for whatever the regime has cooked up for us. So again, that's always something to plug to our great audience who I'm sure needs no, no uh, it's always good to remind even, even uh, the listeners of Radio Rothbard exactly how much content we have at Mises.org. And it's all free. All free. Well, thank you listeners for tuning in to this edition of Radio Rothbard. We'll be back next week with more and we'll see you next time.